Hello, I'm Alan Cozen, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly show about the Beatles as a group, as soloists, historically, uh, currently. Anything that has to do with them, we feel free to bat around. My co-hosts are Ken Michaels, the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, uh, who writes the Beatles Examiner column and many other Examiner columns on the internet. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hey, everyone. And Al Sussman, a very longtime contributor to Beatle Fan, and now um, I think you're listed as executive editor, isn't that right? Hi, Al. Mm-hmm. That, that, and I used to say when I was still living in New York that uh, that and 250 would get you on the subway. I guess it's 275 now, right? Anyway, <laughs> hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so uh, today we have a number of topics in mind, and uh, I thought it would be good to start with the John Lennon tributes that have gone on this this past week um, in commemoration of John's 75th birthday. And Ken went to several of them, right, Ken? Yeah, I went to two, actually. Uh, They were both in New York City. I went to see Billy J. Kramer who put on a performance, and these these were both on John's birthday on October the 9th. And Billy's a longtime friend of mine. I've known him since the 80s, and I've seen him in concert quite often. And, uh, you know, now he's in his uh, early 70s, and he still sounds great. And um, I'm very impressed with his performance. He has a great band that includes Liberty DeVito on drums. And um, in addition to doing... The songs that we know from Billy from the 60s, and especially the Lennon-McCartney songs that were given to him, um, he also has been very much involved with recording new material. He recorded an album recently called I Won the Fight, where he wrote or co-wrote much of the material. So he plays some of that and mixes that with um, the songs from the 60s, as well as a lot of his favorite 50s rock and roll. And uh, the band was just excellent. Every time that I see Billy... I'm just more and more appreciative of the fact that he's still out there doing this on a semi-regular basis. I know he loves performing. He loves more than anything entertaining a crowd. And um, he's still in in fine voice. And um, to tell you the truth, and I I love to show without question, but it was really, you know, a Billy J. Kramer show like most of them, just given the name that it's a Lennon tribute show because it's basically the same songs. And given the fact that you know, he's one of those few people who can claim that uh, they were blessed by being given Lennon McCartney songs to record. And, and Billy is in that class along with Peter Asher and Cilla Black. They were all given several songs written by John or Paul. And Billy did most of those songs in concert. In addition to doing Jealous Guy, which he's been doing for uh, several years now in concert. He also premiered a, a brand new song that he wrote called Peace of Mind, which was nice. And um, it was a thoroughly entertaining show. You know, anytime that you see him, you'll be amazed at how well he still can sing and sing powerfully. And I know that, it, uh, you know, if he had his way, he'd be out there doing a lot more gigs and um, playing the songs that he's proud of from the 60s and mixing that with his newer material. And um, kind of like what I've expressed about Ringo in particular, I'm just very impressed by the fact that He's still growing as an artist, you know, just um, getting more and more involved with songwriting. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you listen to his recent album, you'd know that there's a lot of really good material on there. And he also performs, as he has done several times at the fest for for Beatle fans, the song To Liverpool With Love, which, uh, you know, is very autobiographical and um, has a statement in there about Brian Epstein getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Originally, when when he wrote that song, he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. And mm-hmm. then after he was inducted, then he he uh, re-recorded the song with a whole new set of lyrics, you know, to indicate that he's now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So you have the, that history with Billy, not just the Lennon McCartney songs, also George Martin producing him, Brian Epstein being his manager, someone with that kind of history so closely tied to John. The great thing about all these Lennon tribute shows is that the, there's such a variety of them. You've got all kinds of Beatles tribute bands out there doing tributes to John. Here's somebody that actually had history with mm-hmm. them. Right. And so it's great It's great to see a show 
from, you know, someone, you know, with that in mind. And mm-hmm. um, you also you know, heard after Jeff that, Slate, I, right? Yeah. Yes, Jeff Slate with his band. Um, Jeff, for those of you that don't know, is a fellow contributor to Beatle Fan, and he writes for so many different publications now. Mm-hmm. He's a great interviewer and a great writer, and for many, many years he's been writing music. He was a, in a band called The Badge, and um, he put together a band a few years ago called Birds of Paradox, which had two of the members of Elephant's Memory in there, Gary Van Syok, the bass player, and Adam Ippolito, the keyboardist. And also in the band was Steve Holly the drummer in Wings, the last lineup of Wings, and also Lawrence Juber, the last lead guitarist in Wings, along with Steve. They were in the band together. And Dennis Ferrante, who we mentioned here previously, who recently passed away, also engineered the album as well. So he has a lot of Beatle connections, and he's a passionate music lover of all kinds. Mm -hmm. You know, he can talk about anything, especially a lot of 60s rock and roll. The Beatles are amongst his favorite. I don't know if it is his favorite, because I know he likes so many other uh, bands and artists, uh, you know, he's, from the last several well, decades. He, he's very well versed in Dylan as well, I believe. Yeah, sure. Yes. Has a band um, that does a lot of that. Yeah. And in the band this time, he did have Steve Holly on drums. He had um, a guy named Rick Mullen, who's a great bass player. He's worked with a lot of different people like Don McLean. He had Earl Slick join him for the second set of The Lennon Show. We all know what a great guitarist Earl is. He played on the Double Fantasy Sessions, known for many years with his, with his work with David Bowie. And um, uh, Jimmy Mack, who's a great guitar player. He's been playing with Jeff for quite a long time. And um, this was, uh, you know, a pretty amazing lineup. And um, they did a mixture of Beatles songs, you know, mainly the John songs. A lot of 50s rock and roll that the Beatles covered. The songs from the 50s that John covered on the rock and roll album and a lot of his solo music. And um, along with a lot of familiar favorites, he did go deep. There's a lot of songs there that I really loved. I think he really shined, the band shined most of all on the bluesier songs, like when uh, when they did It's So Hard. Um, they also did Well, Baby, Please Don't Go. A whole bunch of, you know, just great material. I mean, I was surprised to hear... Um, they did God with Jeff on the piano. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Yoko was nice. They did Revolution number one. And, huh? you know, how often do you get to hear anybody do Revolution, the slow version like that, and an acoustic version? Working Class Hero, kind of close to the Mark Hudson version, going on for like 10, 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> you Can't Do That was great with Earl doing the lead guitar work. They did a really spot-on version of I Feel Fine, which was great. New York City. It was just a tremendous performance. Cold Turkey, I think, was the, the one song that won me over. Well, I loved the whole show, but I was really impressed with their performance of that. And the whole show lasted, it started around 9.15 at night, went on till 12.30 in the morning. Wow. So uh, I, was, I was fortunate that I was able to see both shows because they were both very close to each other in New York City. I tried to time it so I can see both, and Jeff's show started late, <laughs> which made me, you know, see the show in its entirety. So, um, you know, I was able to kill two birds at one stone by seeing both concerts the same night. There were like five or six shows in the New York, New England area that I could have gone to, and obviously you can't go to all of them. But this way I was able to tackle two in the same night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anything on other nights? No, that's it for now. <laughs> okay. I know that the Fab Fo, the Fab Fo are playing at the Beacon Theater. I think that's on October the twenty fourth, but that's that's the same night I'm going to see Ringo at Foxwoods, so I can't see oh. that. But right. there are bound to be other Lennon tribute shows as well. Not much going on up here in Portland, Maine. Um, how about you, Al, in Pennsylvania? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, in, we're in Pittsburgh. <laughs> on that note. So, Steve, did you catch anything? No, I didn't personally go to anything, but there were there were some things in um in Los Angeles. They they had a the usual um celebration at the at the Lennon Star on the Walk of Fame, which is right next to the which is at the Capitol Records Tower, although it is not the closest star to the door. That honor belongs to Mr. Garth Brooks, which really irritates me, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but they had they had music, they had um speakers, um 
Ivor, uh, author Ivor Davis was there. Oh, who else was there? Um, Chris Carter of uh, Breakfast with the Beatles uh, was there. Um, Randy Lewis of the LA Times was there. So there were there were uh, and and one of the city councilmen uh, presented um, a uh, resolution for for Lennon. Um, so that was there, and then they had a whole bunch of stuff going on in Liverpool. I'm waiting for details for some of the stuff, but the one of the things they did was they um, they revitalized uh, the the grave site for uh, John's uncle George, um, hmm. who was married to uh, um, uh, Mimi. Uh, and Mimi, right? Uh, and they refurbished that. Apparently, it was in a, it was in great disrepair, and they they fixed that up. And there was a concert at the Cavern with the with the quarrymen and and, and several other people and. So that was among the among the things there, and there was, I heard about there were events in Mexico. There were, I mean, there were events all over the place. There were just way too many. There was stuff in Connecticut um, with uh, Charles Rosenay. So there was right. there was stuff, and uh, Peter Noon put out a a John Lennon tribute single that's available on iTunes now. Um, he released it on October 9th. Chip Mattinger's Lennonology book is out. Um, I don't have a copy of it, but. It is available now. Um, um, more or less. I mean, he's the the last I heard. Um, he's not really expecting anybody to get them in their hands until I think the end of October. I mean, it's not like you can walk into a store and get this. You have right. to have ordered it mm. from his the Lenonology website. Right. Um, I guess it's Lenonology dot com. Right. And uh, uh, if you haven't ordered it, guys, you should. I don't mean you guys. I mean listeners. <laughs> uh, and. Mm. Um, and women. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, he told me he wasn't going through uh, yeah. any any uh, retail outlets. He's going to sell right. them all from, from his website. So, so the official pub date was October 9th, but um, but I think uh, they're, they've, they've just been sort of bound. I think they're being shipped now back to him, and then he has to get them out to everybody. You know, really, just as a, as a, a sideline, I mean, this is sort of a, a, an aspect of Beatles publishing, that uh, we've looked at a little without using it as as a topic as such, but Chuck Gunderson's book is the same way, Bruce uh-huh. Spizer's books. These are basically self-published books, but – you know, in in days of old when we were little, uh, if you heard someone had a self published book, you thought of it as you know, okay, Vanity Press, not mm-hmm. not sure. you know, ideal. But these guys, um, and and I guess it must happen in other fields too. But there is a huge movement of it in Beatles studies. Actually, you might say. actually, um, Spicer's books, um, although he puts them out through his group, have been available on Amazon. Right, that's true. Juber's Lawrence Juber's book was not that way though. He he did the self publishing route. Um, yeah. so there's another one that that did that. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. That I, that a uh, curve bender, the, the which does the, did that Beatles recording sessions book and the two books of Henry Grossman photographs. Right. You know these guys um, have kind of outdone quote, real publishers in terms of using great materials, uh, seeing that the reproductions are good, seeing that the binding is solid. And, you know, they basically are bringing out books that are really higher quality than what they would get from an actual publisher. Right. The, gro- the Grossman, the gross- mm. have you seen the Grossman books and the, and the, um, and oh, the yeah. recording? Yeah, those are, those are gorgeous. They're both absolutely incredible. I mean, mm-hmm. and so is the, and so is the, um, well, we've 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 all seen the uh, the uh, uh, some fun tonight, but yeah, the uh, the Grossman right. books, those other books are fantastic. So yeah, uh-huh. they're it's it's amazing that what's going on, you know, with Beatle publishing in, in this way. In yeah. a way, in a way, I kind of I kind of would hope that a lot of people don't do that because I think a lot of people you know want these books and they're not going to be able to afford them. The Mattinger book looks like, it, from the preview pages I've seen, is going to be incredibly detailed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, he's he's done an awful lot of work on that, and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I suppose any of them could, once they sell their initial runs out, go to a trade publisher and have them pick it up. Like Ringo. Like Ringo, yeah. Sure. Ringo seems to be just about the only, and well, George did 
his, uh, I mean mine as well. Um, but but most of those things that are published by Genesis books don't come out as as trade publications. Right. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe sure. in a way mm-hmm. this all started with the Genesis books. Mm-hmm. Um, I have yeah. I I have not seen the the print version of the Ringo book yet, but I have the ebook, and uh, mm-hmm. I. I'm not sure if there's any differences between the ebook and the and the print version. I mean, the, the ebook is great, you know, but yeah. um, I, I'm guessing that there's more in the print in the print book. But I don't have both to be able to say that extensively. Mm-hmm. But in any event, um, well, also yeah. we we could point out that on um, October the sixth, there was a huge human peace sign mm-hmm. that uh, okay. took place in uh, Central Park. See what you missed, Al? And I know. Yeah. Did they actually set the record? Did they no. get into in this? They no. didn't. They fell far short. It was only a couple thousand, according to the, oh, the story I saw. Yeah, they. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't even get close, unfortunately. But um, they had, you know, they they took the the picture and they had a lot of people there, and she was in Yoko. Yoko was there, but um, yeah, no, they didn't. They didn't make it. That's too bad. Yeah, one other yeah. one other thing we can mention really 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 quick it was the uh the non nomination of Harry Nelson. That right. god right. that was really that was disappointing. That was quite disappointing. I was I actually I don't know why I was silly enough to expect that they would nominate him but um boy that I mean if that anything points up the problems with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame it it does that. And I mean they they even nominated a bunch of people that they had nominated the year before. Oh yeah, and ah. well, not well, not only that, but also hey, Sheik. Uh, hey, <laughs> what the Sheik hell? was nominated for the tenth time, which absolutely confirms to me that in Ahmet Erdogan's will, there must be a stipulation that Sheik be nominated every year for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, because there's no other reason. There is absolutely no other reason. Mm-hmm. Why they've been nominated ten times, mm-hmm. and and there are several others in there that have been nominated more than once. They finally got around to Chicago, right? Well, now they and, and they also yeah. nominated Cheap Trick. Thank goodness. Yes. Uh, yeah. And yes. Well, you know. Yes. But with all these nominations, there's a lot of artists that we ourselves were very happy to see being nominated, and I've also heard that they're now inviting fans to write in, and their vote will will, in some way have some influence. It might be a small influence, but they're asking people to write in with the five artists amongst the ones nominated that they would vote for. And I don't recall that happening before. No, I think they did uh, I think yeah, they did it last year. The last couple of years, I think. Yeah. They, they've uh, included But you know, and, yeah. But not on the But you talk about Yeah. You talk about Harry Nilsson and there's no doubt in my mind that he deserves it, but there are so many other artists too that deserve it. That sure. whose career started before Harry Nilsson. Well, so yes, it is a crime. You know, I can't. It's not like you can point to Harry and say he's number one. There's a lot of other artists that deserve it too, and I'm not saying he doesn't. He deserves it just as just as much as the others. But you know, to to pinpoint him, I think is a little bit unfair. Well, I think it's, I'm glad it's, to see that that yes is in there. I mean, they're nominated. You know, I still haven't seen the Moody Blues, no. and the Moody Blues started before yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they started before Harry Nilsson. And what about fifties artists that still haven't gotten in? The whole the whole criteria is stupid. I mean, when you the the besides Chic, also repeated from last year was NWA, Nine Inch Nails, The Smiths, and The Spinners. Please tell me why at least four of those five are nominated. There, there's no reason. So. You know, I mean, it's well, it's insane. Well, I mean, that's probably personal taste. I mean, but, you know, let's face it, NWA was a very important group in in hip hop. We may not like any of their music, but they were, you know, they were very important. The Spinners were one of the longest lasting uh, groups. I mean, they basically started uh, probably in the latter part of the doo-wop era. Right, and we're and we're still having hits probably into the eighties. And that's that, that's the one group out of those five that I would say would deserve. Yeah. But the Smiths, seriously? Uh, yeah, well, it know. depends what your tastes are. It yeah. depends on what your tastes are, Steve. 
And what what do you have to say about R and B artists that influenced rock artists? You know, yeah. they have to be given their due as no, well. I agree. You I might agree. just say. I agree with that. You know, I'm 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 all for that. Believe me. I, I, but when you you know when you have people like Harry Nilsson and and you have the Monkees and and there's so many other people. I mean, there's there's so many acts. I mean, it's just insane. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. Well, hopefully well, they'll get to all the ones that deserve it. And and but frankly, I I like the list. I do like the list that was presented mm-hmm. here. And frankly, the fact that Harry didn't make the cut once again uh, shows just how uh, how influential, quote unquote, those uh, those stupid Facebook um, petitions are. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I think um, the the nominators change over time and ultimately you'll find, you know, a, a group of nominators who sort of see something that the current ones don't see in Harry Nilsson's work and 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 he'll get in. I I, I have no doubt mm-hmm. that he'll eventually get in, but um yeah, it is it, it is sad that he didn't get in this time, but mm-hmm. you know, it's just the rock and roll hall you know, of fame, I mean. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's very true. Very very yeah, I can true. make a case. I can make a case for Todd Rundgren easily, you know. Sure. Mm-hmm. There's so many sure. artists out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And when we, when we did this show several months ago, one of the things that I expressed was, you know, there are artists that I may not be a big um, Green Day fan, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who think that they deserve to get in. And I'm not going to argue with that, but I think Ringo getting in the same year as Green Day, that's wrong. You know, mm-hmm. I think that it should really be more based on when artists started their careers, you know. Do it chronologically instead of mixing it all up and having a 90s act mixed with someone who's whose career started in 1970 in the case of Ringo with his solo music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can see why they do. So, I mean, they, they want it. Sure. They want the uh, the show to appeal to a, a broad audience. And mm-hmm. and so right. they want to want to mix it up for that. And and, you know, plus, uh, I mean, they, they become eligible chronologically. But it's 25 years, right? Some, mm-hmm. they, they right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't get that exercised about all this. I mean, there are a lot of people I'd like to see in there that that aren't or aren't nominated. But you know, I, I'm assuming that they'll all get in there eventually anyway. It's they they just have a a certain number per year, also they can induct for I right. guess logistical reasons. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't know. It's 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 it, I don't think it's an immensely important institution, but it's it can be fun, you know. Uh, I don't know. I, I went to their their induction dinner one year um, because when McCartney was inducted, they had asked me to write the thing that went in the book that they handed out, mm. um, oh. and that that since it was <laughs> it was free, but you got a ticket to <laughs> to the dinner, um, and I thought, well, okay, that's that's uh, actually not a bad trade off, especially given that you know going to go the year that he's being inducted he's going to play you're saying whatever he didn't know that we get to see stella in her t-shirt mm, <laughs> um, right. and all that other stuff but uh you know but it, it actually was a lot of fun and um you know so i so I, I part of me has a soft spot for the rock and roll hall of fame and part of me actually doesn't care that much about who gets nominated who gets in I, i'm just assuming they all will eventually and uh, don't get that exercised about it. I mean, I, 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 I totally understand why people do. However, you know, there are things that they should. It's just, they, yeah, I know. I know. It's just a sign of acknowledgement of the greatness of certain artists. Right. And we all have our favorites. And no matter what, there's always going to be some that won't get in that will bother some of us. Yeah. And it's probably always going to be that way. But the mere fact that you've got yes and Chicago finally being nominated at least that's a good step you know and cheap Mm -hmm. trick and uh, i'm happy you know i i actually voted for the spinners you know i think they deserve it steve miller's in there you know to me these are all good signs Uh well what about the ruddles there we go (laughs) talk about the crime of the century i think the ruddles should get in (laughs) tiny tim and weird al there Mm. you go yeah anyway all right. Mrs. Miller. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So Steve and Ken were both taken with um, an interview that appeared in uh, one of the blogs, uh, Critics at Large, uh, this week. Actually, it appeared on October 9th, another uh, installment of John Lennon tributes in a, in a, in a in a sort of lateral way. Um, and this was an interview with Mark Lewison. And uh, there were a couple of things that that struck um, the two of you. Uh, which of you wants to give us the actual quote? Ken, go ahead. You go first. Well, first of all, uh, the person who asked these questions, this was in um, the website Critics at Large. Mm-hmm. And there was a woman, I don't actually have her name. It's at the it bottom of the page dear- here. It's Deirdre Kelly. Okay. Well, Deirdre says, this is uh, about maybe two-thirds into the interview. So when I read there, there, the Beatles story, um, yours hasn't come to the end yet, meaning Mark's. When I read about them, I get the sense of a Greek tragedy, because as you get to know them, you love them, and then it all unravels for reasons that appear to have something to do with hubris or short-sightedness, and the wish is that someone or something had intervened to save them from themselves. I genuinely experienced a great sadness after I read their story, which is a great story that flames out and which didn't need to happen. The whole Apple debacle, for instance, Mark says, I don't know Apple was a debacle. And then Deirdre says, you don't? Or do I have to wait until the last volume to ask you? The wasted money, the clashing egos... And Mark says it needs to be looked at again. Deirdre says, really? And this is the the quote that I really, I I praise Mark so much for saying this. Everything must be looked at again. I refuse to accept such preconceived views. There are many entrenched opinions about the Beatles' history. This was a mistake. If only that had happened. Brian Epstein squandered all the merchandising rights. Magic Alex was a charlatan. The Maharishi episode was the devil. Magical Mystery Tour was a folly. <laughs> you listening, Steve? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Apple was a waste of money. All the usual things, but I won't allow any of that into my head. I refuse to look at things that way. My approach is that everything must be considered anew. So I'll gather all the information, the knowledge and information, write it without prejudice, and see what it says. Perhaps readers will still come to the same conclusions. But perhaps they won't. And I think that last line is the real key because I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of – I mean you're assuming that there's going to be a ton of changes and I don't see that that's going to happen. Um, There are certain things, including Magical Mystery Tour, that are not – I mean the opinions on that are not going to change. I'm sorry. You know, I mean – Steve, Steve, you don't have a crystal ball here. You don't know how people are going to view this – or any kind of art in the future. That's one point that I like to make with you is that whether you're talking about a movie, whether you're talking about a song or an album or a sculpture or a film, things people's opinions can change over time. And we don't know how people are going to look at the Beatles' works and their solo works, and we don't know all that. That could change in 10 years from now or 50 years from now or 100 years from now. I can, th- I can, think, so, I can think of one thing that changed or that that started out with, with a bad opinion and changed over time to be brilliant. And that was Layla by Derek and the Dominoes. This is magical mystery tour is not Layla. It never will be. Okay. You can only think of one example like that. Uh, that Layla. Was the, that was the first thing that came, <laughs> came, came to mind because it was such a, it was such a complete turnover. I mean, it really okay, was. But it really Steve, was. Steve, this is just your opinion and you have a right to your opinion. But to think that everyone's going to feel the same way years from now is wrong. <laughs> we had this we had this argument when we when we reviewed Magical Mystery Tour, and you were you were there trying to support it and trying to and and you know trying to be nice about it. And I I I mean even the if if it was going to if anybody if the opinions were going to change. The better version of, of Magical Mystery Tour would have done it. It didn't do it, Ken, and you know it. Yeah. It never will. I think, in a way, this strays away I, from the, the biographical yes. question because yes. the details about Magical <laughs> Mystery Tour aren't going to be what changes people's opinions. It will be the right. the work itself, um, and that's out there for people to to see. You know, mm-hmm. in at this point, pretty much optimum quality. Okay. Hmm. So, but but I think what 
what Ken was impressed with was was Mark's general approach of being sort of a tabula rasa as he goes into the the uh, the work of the biography. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, you know, and- in a way, that's exactly as a, what a biographer should do. And it's right. what I think a lot of biographers do, although not generally so far Beatles biographers. Um, yeah. You know, um, generally speaking, Beatles biographers haven't had Mark's time scale to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, maybe they should have taken it. Maybe someone should have taken it. But no one, I think, who's done their you know, the bigger Beatles biographies um, has been quite as fascinated with them as Mark is. Um, Mm. Mark also has, of course, the existing biographies to use as a kind of skeleton and roadmap. You know, you, you know, from having read 10 or 15 or probably in his case, 50 or a hundred Beatles biographies, you know, who the people that you need to talk to are that you need to get to that you need to uh, understand what they think and, and, and all of that stuff. And, uh, but you also, I think, go to it with uh, what he wants to do is go to it with a, a sort of completely fresh slate but not an uninformed fresh slate. You know, it's like going mm-hmm. to interview Paul. You know, if you go there completely as a fresh slate, he'll tell you that he dreamed yesterday and that he stopped eating mm-hmm. meat because he and Linda saw the gambling lambs and, you know, all of right. the stories. Um, you know, so I think he's going armed with the knowledge of what people have already said um, and trying to get them to, to get away from their set pieces, you know? I mean, I know that one of his... Um, one of his techniques, a brilliant interviewing technique, is he'll turn up with a photo or a piece of memorabilia or an article of clothing even, just something that the person he's interviewing has a connection with and hasn't seen for 50 years. And his feeling is that, you know, this gets them to open up, you know? Yeah, you know, I... I, I, mm. I I wore that shirt the day that was the day that John put the toilet seat over his head, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, it just, it just opens up memories that, you know, all these people who surrounded the Beatles all those years at this point really have set pieces that they say over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily factual, you know, they've got, Mm -hmm. you know, encrusted uh, ornamentation, let's say around them. And so he wants to get through that that and that's you know that's one of his his things also though you know i mean the the list of things that he gave uh you know magic alex i i probably ought not comment on um (laughs) and and some of the others of you know he's taking the the view that what we think we know about all of these things may or may not be the case you know and he found certain things, after all, in the first volume that, you know, solved some riddles and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and a lot of what he got. Also, I, I should say, apart from going to talk to people who's, who've been interviewed a million times and trying to get them to say something other than they than their set piece, he's been digging up people who've never even been asked, mm-hmm. you know. Right. And and that's interesting, too. And it, it provides a, a level of depth in the story that um, I think no one's gotten to before. That's one of the that's one of the great things about the book is how many people he talked to. I mean, he just went to I mean, the the resources for that book for that book are just amazing. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's what is one of the real strong points of the book that he he talked to just so many people. And like you say, so many people that had never been talked to before so but yeah. the great thing about him is that you know there's so many Beatle books that have come out many of them have inaccuracies in them and then you find mm-hmm. other Beatle books come out after that that just repeat the same inaccuracies because they use the same right. sources and right. Mark actually does the research you know he painstakingly does this research to the point where he wants to make sure it is as completely accurate as possible which is almost impossible but because somewhere along the line there's got to be a mistake (laughs) in just about every book but he's as close to perfect as you could get and he digs up information that you just you you haven't heard before Mm -hmm. and if you think that you've learned everything there is to learn about the Beatles that first volume was just staggering with all kinds of 
uh, as I've said in this show, there's so many twists and turns in the Beatles story where they could have went in another direction. Mm -hmm. And it's just a fascinating read. You know, you actually right. feel like you're living with them <laughs> as you're reading this. Right. But sure. um, who's to say that there aren't things that we haven't uncovered about the things that he's talked about? Mm -hmm. Was Apple really the debacle that it's made out to be? Depends on who you talk to. You know, was Brian, did he squander all the merchandising rights? Was he really bad in that sense? You know, is there more to the story than we that we don't know about? You know? Mm -hmm. There's so much that we really don't know, and if anyone's going to uncover it, it's going to be him. Presumably. Oh, you know, and the other thing is that he's always said that, you know, he's he obviously wants to write, I guess, the, the definitive story, but he doesn't intend it to shut down everybody else's research. He's He's hoping that what he finds that's new and fresh sort of inspires other people to sort of take the same route and look deeper at some of the things that he's already looked at because, you know, maybe those will change too, you know, that's his feeling. Mm. I mean, that's what he says anyway. And, um, you know, that's sort of how biography works long term, you know, right. you, 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 new generations uncover new things, uh, you know, it's, sometimes things just aren't available. I mean, people will put their papers under lock and key until 50 years after they die, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And when they, when mm. they do that, there's sometimes, you know, nothing you can do. I don't know if that's the case in any of the Beatles things, but you know, the other thing is, um, you know, and well, Mark and I have had some very long talks about, Oh, magic Alex, for instance, <laughs> um, you know, and what he says is, you know, because basically uh, the listeners probably know that when I was writing for The Times, we were sued over a piece I wrote by Magic Alex for calling him a charlatan and uh, a number of other things saying that he started the rumors um, that led the Beatles to leave Rishikesh, etc. It, it actually was a bit more involved in that. It wasn't just Magic Alex. I think it was also that that, that John's attention span um, for uh, his Messiah of the week um, only really extends <laughs> for a few weeks. Huh. Mm -hmm. And then he's Alex coming down and starting these rumors was, was kind of convenient for John. You know, it's like this was when he was wanting to leave anyway. Um, but all of that said, during the, the preparation for this um, case or the research for it, we mainly uh, – our lawyers interviewed basically everybody who was involved with the Beatles at that time or was in Rishikesh. I mean they dug up lots and lots of people, and basically everyone said the same things about Magic Alex, and I've, I've mentioned this to Mark, and um, uh, he's seen some of the materials, and he says, yes, but – you need to understand that the people around the Beatles will say what the Beatles say, generally speaking. So if the Beatles take mm -hmm. the view that Magic Alex is this or Magic Alex is that, you're going to hear it from everyone around them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure that that's the case because after all, the Beatles started out by saying that Magic Alex was magic. Sure. And um, later on had a different opinion or some of them had a different opinion. So I, I'm not totally sure that everyone around them is that malleable. But um, but this is this is what he's saying about why he doesn't accept, you know, what already has been said. You know, he'll he'll grill people um, and until he gets to, you know, what strike him as a, a more the actual, you know, way that they're thinking about something or looking at something despite what their initial position is. So, you know. Hmm. Hmm. Well, is, the, is there anything wrong? You know, Mark is trying to write the definitive Beatles biography. Mm -hmm. In having a book that is universally looked at as being that, I mean, I would probably, if volumes two and three are as good as volume one, yeah. I will probably look at this as being the definitive biography. Um, not that I wouldn't refer to other books, especially, you know, you talk about, you know, Some Fun Tonight from Chuck Gunderson. Who else has done more research about each individual concert that the Beatles did in North America? There's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other books that I will refer to from time to time. But as far as a, a general, well, in-depth biography, what's wrong with having something like that worldwide that everyone can look at that way I, I and also it, take into account the beatles own words you know the beatles anthology that counts yeah 
Yeah, I don't think anybody would would say there's anything wrong with it, and it it's certainly basically any major biographer's goal, you know. But he's taking, um, you know, I think he's writing a biography sort of like, uh, you know, the people who've written, you know, about Lyndon Johnson or you know, uh, political figures, then and no one has really stepped up to do a Beatles biography quite on that scale. Um, mm-hmm. and that's, you know, that's, see, I mean, there are different kinds of biography, right? You know, I mean, some of them you write fairly quickly and some of them you take 20 years to do, you know, he, right. he expects to spend the rest of his life doing this. And, uh, mm. you know, I know pretty much everyone who read the first book is looking forward for it to 2020 when the next one's supposed to come out. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I know. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Do you think anyone would assert that there's anything wrong with it? I don't know. Well, well, well we, we were talking about this before the show, before right. it began taping, and Steve made the point that he felt that you were talking about context, mm-hmm. right, Steve? Yeah. In what, in what fashion? Well, I, I think you have to be careful. I, I think to assume that Mark's going to overturn every, 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 uh, every viewpoint that everybody has is, is, is actually kind of unfair on Mark because there's a lot of things that I think are going to, you know, that are not going to change. I mean, I, I will, I will submit that, that Mark did change a lot of minds and a lot of viewpoints with the, with the, um, with the first book. I mean, the biggie obviously was Pete Best. I mean, which I've, actually everybody should have figured out on their own, but they didn't, but but I mean, that's it's all pretty well, you know, accepted. I think even even I've read Pete talking about it since, and he, even he kind of realizes now that that was the reason. I mean, I'd seen Pete. There had been other people that had mentioned this before, but nobody believed it until Mark said it, which is really kind of kind of weird, you know. And the whole yeah. George Mar- George Martin signing them thing now, you know. I mean, I'm sure that we're going to find there's going to be some stuff we're going to find out uh, you know. I I will say he is approaching it as a journalist, which is good. But I think you also have to not get too over anxious that every the, the world's going to turn upside down. I don't think that's going to happen, really. But we'll see. I mean, I don't know what he has. You know, for book two, I'm as anxious as anybody to find out. And hopefully, you know, I'm going to be around for the next two of them. Uh, So we'll see. Well, book two is only in five more years. I know. That's (laughs) how Mark uh, Alan, how old is he? Um, Gosh, (laughs) uh, I guess he's in his upper 50s at this point. Yeah, I mean, Uh, he's really uh, that's really bumping the. uh, Bumping the border there, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I hope, uh, I hope if the if the second one's in five years, the third one's going to be a little sooner than five more years. So, right. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the you would think that actually the second two books shouldn't take as long as the first because the first involved you know generations and generations of right. Of, of of digging and and the whole you know the history of Liverpool and the context and all that and uh, you know I don't think that has to be done for every place else in the world they set foot necessarily mm-hmm. you know and uh, also during the period he was working on the first book he was interviewing for the later books too I mean obviously he was focusing most on the first book but you know he was. I think painfully aware that all of these people are getting older and, uh, or, you know, he wants to get them while they're still with us, obviously. Uh, so he's, he's done some work on the later books already in terms of interviewing and, and gathering materials. And, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that he speeds it up a bit, but I, I, I don't think he really will, uh, because his feeling is that he wants to leave i mean he's put it this way uh, he wants to leave no stone unturned and as long as there are stones still you know lying there waiting for him to turn them over and and he has the time he'll do it so i i you know i think he will i think i think it'll be earlier than that just uh, just a feeling i mean i i mean you've talked to him and and but based on what you said about he, him doing all that research for the first book 
I would think that it's not going to it's not going to need to be 2020 unless he's really going to uh, if he's going to put out extended versions of all three books like he did the first one. Well, I mean, that's that's a big that's a big task, but we'll see. I hope it's sooner than 2020. I think a lot of people do. Sure. Well, based on this interview, he said that he hasn't actually written anything for volume right. two yet. Right. It's right. just all research that he's done. Mm hmm. And research alone is such a full-time job. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure that so much of what he's doing, if he finds something that applies to 1969, even if that's not covered in the next book, then he's got to take it now. You know, whatever information he can get now, especially if it's from people who are on in years, you never know, you know, how much longer they have. He's sure. got to take advantage of that while right. he can. So just doing the research is, is an enormous enormous uh responsibility and a lot of work right so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right we'll see we'll see what happens but i just okay. think in particular that quote that quote really struck me because i just like the fact that he approaches everything with fresh ears you mm -hmm. know and you know he's willing to to dig and find out any, any information that he can and he doesn't automatically just accept whatever the story is right now okay you know mm -hmm. Even if it's yeah. been repeated many times over. And some right. of us, we all fall guilty of thinking a certain way. Like yeah. I think a certain way about Alan Klein because of what I've heard about him. But maybe, and I haven't actually read the, the new book on Alan Klein. I don't know if any of you guys even I, have an interest in it. I haven't read But, uh, haven't you know, read. maybe there's more to the story there with the Beatles than we do know. So, who knows? Yeah, and, and a lot of these authors, you know, tend to bring their uh, their own particular prejudices to these books, mm -hmm. you know, and particularly like particularly the insider books. Mm -hmm. Jeff Emmerich's book is probably, a, you know, a, a, a very good example of a book where, you know, he obviously has, you know, had agendas that he wanted to put forth in this book, you know, his own version of the of the history, mm -hmm. you know, right? And, and he may know, have had more agendas than memories, actually. Uh, ex exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, somebody, some people have said that George Martin has much the same thing, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, so it's so it is good that there is somebody who is willing to to look at the history like a you know as if it's a blank canvas and to tell the story as accurately and objectively as he possibly can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was a, a perfectly interesting interview. Besides the bits that we talked about, you might want to look up um, critics, critics at large. And uh, if you Google critics at large and Mark Lewison, you'll find it right away. And in the meantime, we let's go back a little bit to the John Lennon um, 75th birthday celebrations. Um, it kind of was hard not to miss the fact that um, there were no releases of any kind um, of, you know, unreleased material or, or packages that, uh, that Yoko might have overseen that are coming out. And, and we've heard of some in the works, you know, the, um, the one-to-one -one concerts are supposed to be sort of on their way out, but they didn't manage to make it for this birthday. Any thoughts, anyone? Ken? Yeah, well, um, it, it is very possible that Either the one-to-one -one concert isn't finished yet, the work hasn't been, hasn't been finished so far, and they're not ready to release it. Then there's also the thought that with Paul's remasters coming out for Tug of War and Pipes of Peace and the Beatles 1 Plus coming out in November, there may be just uh, you know, quite a lot for Beatle fans right there to, uh, to chew on, so that maybe it might get lost in the shuffle if that was released along with the other releases. And then there's always the possibility that she might put it out close to the anniversary of his death. Usually when Yoko does anything, she tries to tie it in with John's birthday. But right. we do know for a fact that Jack Douglas has been working on the one-to-one -one concerts. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that there'll be bonus material and probably stuff right. from the rehearsals. Um, right. And we all know how badly <laughs> the concert needs to be cleaned up based right. on the old video cassette that came out. Um, mm -hmm. And also the CD. So, and there's all this work between the afternoon and evening shows and what actually does come out from those. So, right. um, I really do think that probably most of it 
has been done already, but I the, the so. Beatles one release is going to be so huge, in my opinion, that it would overshadow everything else. That um, maybe that's part of the reason why it hasn't come out. My opinion. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, I I heard I um, I was on a panel once um, with some people, and Jack Douglas came up and talked to us at the end, and and he said that they were working on that, and that it was going to be mind blowing. I'm I would hope that they would put out both shows, or at least you know Lennon's performances from both shows. But, you know, who knows what they have in mind. But you're right about the timing. Um, I would think in that case that um, she would probably push it into 2016. That would make sense. I mean, she tends not to do things to, to that bring special attention to the day of his death. Everyone's already mm-hmm. sort of aware of it. Um, mm-hmm. it, it. You wouldn't put out something celebratory. So, uh, And it's probably also not far enough from... The Beatles one release, which let's let's figure that that and the McCartney reissues will sort of tie up the Christmas market for um, for this year. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I I would I would hope that early in 2016 those things turn up. Yeah. Any yeah. Uh, any Better. other news? <laughs> Sorry. Steve? <laughs> no, I can't. No, not really. I mean, Ringo's. You said you're going to see Ringo, uh, Ken. I'm seeing Ringo at Foxwoods, and that's on that's in Connecticut Foxwoods Casino on October the 24th, and so I'm looking forward to that. And um, I just saw an interview that he get, gave in Toronto where he actually said that he's planning on recording his next album in January. So it's just uh, you know exciting to me to see that he just keeps on continuing with the recording. Hmm. And it doesn't seem to matter whether his records sell or not. He just enjoys it, and he just keeps keeps keeping on. <laughs> okay. Well, so we'll have a report from you on, on Ringo after you see him. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I guess that's a wrap for this week. And um, you can write to us, folks. Where, Steve? Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com. And on Twitter? Things we said fab. Okay. We actually have had some emails, and we try to answer them when we can. Had some comments on our on the YouTube versions of the podcast as well. But keep sending them in. Send us in suggestions, ideas, anything you want us to cover, and or any questions you have. So for this week, uh, I'm Alan Cozen, and for... Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, and Steve Marinucci. Goodbye for this time, and see you soon. Mm-hmm.